This message comes to you from King's Church Wirral, UK. We hope that as you listen, you will be encouraged, blessed and inspired. So we are into our eighth week of our current series, teaching series, looking at why. Why are we encouraged and instructed to take part in certain practices? What is it about these practices that is important for us as apprentices of Jesus and for his kingdom? And one thing that has struck me throughout this teaching series is that these practices are good for us. They are a blessing if we are prepared to engage with the practice and to make it a part of our life. We've done fasting, sharing the Lord's table, worship, living simply, living generously, serving and seeking the face of God are all practices which if we engage with will do us good. But the question that's continued to also come through this series is, Are we going to be the foolish person who hears but does nothing with it? Are we going to hear about how to live in a way that brings us closer to God, helps us to develop a more Christ-like character and as such further the kingdom and yet not do anything about it? Or are we going to be the wise person? Are we going to put into practice the things that Jesus asks? Do you want to be more like Jesus? And if you consider yourself an apprentice to Jesus, then I I think the answer should be yes. (laughs) But ultimately, I can't make that choice for you. Only you can make that choice. Only you can say, yes, I'm going to partake in these practices. God can't make you. I can't make you. Your friends can't make you. Only you can make that choice to say, yes, I'm going to put something into practice. And at our table last week, we were asking this question and and looking at ways about what would be helpful to help us put these practices in place. You know, we were looking at seeking um, God's face and it's like, okay, what can we practically do to put this into place? And I encourage you at your tables, have a chat about it, have a discussion, help each one another, share ideas of how can we put these practices into place. So this week is also one of those practices that will do you good and it will also bring kingdom into your neighbourhood and community. And to some, this practice might seem really easy. You might have it nailed down and think, yeah, I've got that sussed. But for some others, this practice will be one that you're like, I do not even want to engage with this. Why is it in the Bible? So today's practice is why hospitality? And hospitality will conjure up different images for people. It might be being invited to a house, the lovely spotless clean home, heating just at the right temperature, having a lovely three course meal of the finest foods, your glass being continued topped up, weighted on hand and foot, having your every need met, great conversation with friends and family, and just that great opportunity to be entertained. And often if you've been to someone's house like that, where you looked after really well, you will think, wow, they are really hospitable. They have the gift of hospitality. And based on this view, some of you in the room might be thinking, that's me, I do have the gift, you know, and it's okay to say if you're good at something, you might be, yeah, actually, yeah, I I do make a good host. I'm good at making people feel welcome when they come in and serving people. Or you might be thinking, I know who Steph is talking about. I've been to those people's houses and yes, they are great at entertaining. They were great hosts. Whereas for some of us, we might think, no, not me. I am rubbish at being hospitable. And there could be many reasons why, you know, but my house, my house isn't big enough. I don't even have a table for people to sit around. You know, three course meal, it would be beans on toast if you came to my house. You know, isn't hosting something that a woman does? You know, and you know, well, some people just have that gift, so I'll leave it up to them. 
But I want to dispel the myths today, the image of hospitality that you've conjured up in your head. That was my image. I don't know if that represented a lot of other people's thoughts of what hospitality was. But often we can give excuses as to why this cannot be me. But also for those who are good at it, just to be challenged to the core of what hospitality actually is about. So why is this practice so important that we included it in our teaching series? Throughout the whole Bible, Old and New Testament, you will see ongoing references of hospitality. And the definition of the word hospitality is philoxenia. Literally translate the love of a stranger. The exact opposite of xenophobia is the fear and hatred of strangers. We're looking at philoxenia, the love of a stranger. Right at the beginning, pre-fall, we see a well God created, which he made man to live in. He breathed, spoke life into him, and freely shared all he had. He shared all he had with man. What's mine is yours. Live in this world. Eat from the land. Work in the land. Rest in the land. I have provided you with all that you need. But obviously we know that the fall came. Further on in Genesis 18, we read of Abraham greeting the strangers. People he had never met before. He honors them. He provides water for their feet. He gives them shade to rest in. He selects a tender choice calf to be prepared as food for them. This was not a quick hello, goodbye on the doorstep. This was a welcoming in to people he wasn't expecting. And it would have taken time to prepare the food. He gave them the best and didn't hurry them along. He fellowshiped with them and made them feel welcome. And God expands this notion of hospitality to include more than meals. It became central to the very identity for what it meant to be the people of God. Leviticus 19 says, treat the foreigner as your native born. Don't treat the stranger differently. Show them the same treatment as you show each other, like you show maybe your friends and family. In 1 Samuel 25, we read of a wealthy man, Nabal, who was killed for not showing hospitality to David and his men. Isaiah 58, God challenges the people in their rebellion and talks about the true meaning of fasting. One of our practices, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh, if you do this, if you share your bread with the hungry, bring the homeless into your home, if you will cover the naked with clothes, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of your Lord will be your rear God. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. Throughout the Old Testament, there's about 25, 30 specific examples of hospitality being spoken of towards a stranger. And we see this same idea coming through of hospitality into the New Testament. In Luke 9, Jesus commands the disciples not to take anything for their journey. No staff, bag, bread, money or extra shirt. It was expected that those who they stayed with would provide, would provide the hospitality. They would love the stranger and provide for him whilst he was there. In Acts, we read of Lydia receiving her conversion through the spiritual generosity shown to her by Paul and his cohorts. And through the work of the Spirit in her heart, she immediately extends hospitality to the group of Jewish men and again when they're released from prison. Luke in Acts um, writes and gives two verses of chapter eight, 28 to mention the hospitality that Paul received for three days and the generosity of the people. The native people showed us unusual kindness for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. And you might be thinking, well, that's 
that's great stuff you know that was just the culture they lived in the practice of the day they offered hospitality it was just the way it was and you know maybe about I don't know about 60 years ago more I was I wasn't alive then so I'm not 100% sure maybe we'd have behaved more in that way you know but culture's changed society has changed there's so many rules ways of doing things awareness of risks dangers that can prevent just this way of living today but I want to continue, and you've heard some verses, I'm going to continue with some more, because the biggest example of hospitality, the love of a stranger, is Jesus. If you have read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you will get a glimpse into Jesus' ministry. And one thing that comes through, especially in the Gospel of Luke, 50, refer 50 references to food and eating. Matthew has 94 references is Jesus was either on his way to a meal, he was eating a meal, or he was leaving a meal. He met the individual where they were at and would invite himself round for food. As he didn't have a home of his own, he didn't let that stop him. He would welcome the company of those who were the outcast of society. For example, the interaction with Zacchaeus, chief tax collector in Luke 19. Zacchaeus, a tax collector, he was hated by the Jewish people. Tax collectors and prostitutes, they were seen as the worst in society. Just try and put um, into perspective, um, if you were to think of what society might think of as the worst person, I know we're not really meant to think like this, but it's just to try and get you to imagine Jesus then saying, you know what, I'm going round to their house for dinner. Rabbis, they wouldn't be caught eating in the homes of tax collectors. And here we have Jesus, recognized as a rabbi, inviting himself to the home of a sinner. There was shock amongst the people, confusion, you know, maybe anger. Why on earth is Jesus giving his time to go and have dinner with a tax collector? And yet this was who Jesus would share a meal with. The crowd's response going to Zacchaeus' house for tea was one of, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Jesus didn't have a home, so instead he invited himself round to people's homes to be a host. He was not just focused on the physical needs, the people that came to him bringing healing, but he was also focused on the inner being of the person, the salvation of a person. Jesus modeled perfect hospitality as he moved from the mundane physical needs to meet the deeper needs of those who came to him. And often when in the crowd, he would address the crowd, but when the individual, he would address them where they were at, often over a meal or at a table. And even in the instance of the feeding of the 4,000, they were not in his home. But Jesus said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. 4,000 people. They, it was their choice to stay for three days without food. But Jesus had compassion. He showed love to the stranger. He showed hospitality. He not only brought the physical healing as mentioned previously in the verse, but also expressed his love through providing nourishment for them. Tim Chester's in his book, A Meal with Jesus, says, the son of man came to seek and save the lost. That was what Jesus did. The son of man came eating and drinking. That was how Jesus did it. There was a reason why it says that Jesus was a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, because that's where people saw him. <laughs> that's what people saw him doing. He was eating and drinking with people that society didn't want to associate with. How did he win them? A meal at a time. Let me just throw it in here, just as a little challenge. When was the last time you had someone round to your home? I know it's been difficult with COVID and regulations, but recently, 
When did you last have someone round to your home? So many references are made of Jesus eating with people. Our friend in Birmingham, he he used to live in a shared accommodation. Um, so he would um, go buy food, bring it, to that, bring it to whoever's house he was going to and cook. He didn't let it stop him. In Matthew 25, starting at verse 21, Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, for I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. And again, they'll come back with the same answer. Lord, when did we see this? He'll reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Jesus offers this clear invitation to a deeper life. Hospitality. Feed the hungry, welcome the stranger, visit the prisoner. See, the root of hospitality comes from the command to love God and to love our neighbours. In Romans 12, we are told also to love our enemies. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Why is this practice of hospitality so important? Because Jesus did it. Jesus showed love to the stranger. You see, spiritual practices, they're not just about getting good at the practice, but it's about our spiritual transformation. They shape us into being people who are more like Jesus and who are more deeply connected to Jesus. The question is, Do we want this? Do we want to reflect Jesus to our communities, to show love to the stranger, to share kingdom? And it reminds me of those bands people used to wear, um, What Would Jesus Do, WWJD? Let me tell you, if it's not clear enough, what would Jesus do if he was here today? He would love the stranger. He would show hospitality. He would have a meal with people. He would be himself in the circumstances that he was in and he would win people a meal at a time. You see, the practice of the gift of hospitality, it's not just good for us. For those of us who want to become more like Christ and have a deeper intimacy with him, hospitality is also good for the spreading of God's kingdom on earth. Back in Jesus' time, the believers met in people's homes. It wasn't set up like we see today, gathering here on a Sunday morning, having a time of prayer, worship, preach. They met in each other's homes, like we do at our tables in the week, sharing with one another, remembering Jesus' sacrifice, praying for one another, inviting people to our tables. They didn't have buildings, big stages, lights, sound systems. They didn't have the celebrity Christians, conferences, 
political powers knew what they had was their homes. They used their homes to spread the kingdom, not just one person's home or the few people who volunteered. It was fluid. They would meet in each other's. You know, it's great. We now do have the means to meet here today. But let us not lose what it meant to use our homes. The primary way the gospel spread, and it spread quickly, was through people meeting together in each other's homes, inviting people, showing hospitality, the love of the stranger. There would have been new people at the table who had heard, who had been invited, and they were welcomed. They were shown love. The church grew, despite at this time being a massive amount of torture going on for those who said they were followers of Christ. And this continued the meeting in each other's homes until about 300 AD with Constantine. But this is how they brought um, and shared the gospel with one another. You know, hotels, hospitals, they come from this very concept of hospitality, the love of a stranger, providing for their health and well-being. So what is hospitality? The love of a stranger providing food, shelter, fellowship, making someone to feel welcome and loved in your home, to serve the stranger, treating strangers and friends alike. It's welcoming one another into our homes and lives. Hospitality is inclusive. It connects people. It requires service to one another, blurring the line between host and guest. It's a regular, rhythmic part of your life, not something planned weeks in advance. It provides justice for the poor. Hospitality touches lives in an intimate and personal way. It's making someone feel welcome, showing your love and care for them. It's not an extension of wealth, it's the extension of self, regardless of means. It doesn't require you to have a massive house or a huge income. It goes with what is available, a lot or a little. It is extending love, care, acceptance to one another. It's being prepared to set time aside for fellowship and being flexible in order to accommodate the impromptu gatherings. You can share your heart and life with others. Even if the meal is simple and the setting is humble, it is sharing, inviting, providing and being. Expressing the love of God through tangible acts of love, namely through the giving of food, shelter, relationship. It's less about what we do and more about who we are. As in 1 Peter, it says to offer hospitality without grumbling. But what hospitality easily gets confused with, which was my, how I um, pictured hospitality to you at the beginning, is with entertainment. You see, hospitality is not the entertainment of friends and family. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's great having great times with friends and family. But it loses from the element of what hospitality is, the love of a stranger. It may include fellowship with believers, but it looks very different to entertaining. Entertaining is an exclusive performance. There's a clear line between the host and the guest. And it's often sporadic in nature. You know, if you've got your diaries, can anyone make the such and such of March or April? Um, and entertaining, it can often take turns. You come to me and then I'll come back to your house. Jennifer McCammon talks about hospitality versus entertaining. And she says this, Entertaining is an elaborate host-centered spectacle where visitors are invited to admire the host's fine things and accomplished skills. Biblical hospitality, on the other hand, has nothing to do with potpourri or appetizers and everything to do with putting others first. Hospitality focuses on serving, encouraging and giving value to others. In Christ, we have the ability to love the unlovable. 
we can be good at entertaining and I know there's lots of people in this room who are brilliant at it and it's an absolute blessing to go to their home. But let's separate it from the practice of hospitality as it is a different thing. And like with all the practices, if it's not natural to us now, if it seems way off, that's okay because we continue to practice the practice. And the more we practice, the easier and the more used to it we will become. But the potential barriers to hospitality is this. It will be inconvenient and it can interrupt your everyday routine. Those of us who like routine, it can interrupt that. It requires being prepared to make time. Again, we live in a world where there is never enough time to do what we want to do. And it's also being prepared to let people see your life. It's very difficult just to put a smile on your face and pretend everything is okay when people come into your home and become part of your life. Even lightheartedly getting the hoover out before everyone comes around, putting all the washing away to make the house look nice. It's just letting people be part of your life. Rosa Butterfield is known for her autobiography, The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, an English professor's journey into the Christian faith. Now, Rosa, she was part of the LGBTQ community, and it was at this time she was researching the religious right and their politics of hatred against the queer community. She wrote an article criticizing the evangelical organization Promise Keepers. Now a pastor, having read this article, wrote to her and invited her to dinner. He didn't know her, he'd read her article and invited her to dinner. Her subsequent friendship with this family led her to her reevaluation of her presuppositions and two years later, Butterfield came to faith. She had been someone who thought very little of the church. But after two years of regularly just meeting in the home of his pastor and his wife, she decided to become a follower of Christ. And it's just she's got some great thoughts. And I just would like to share some of the thoughts that she talks about on hospitality. Hospitality turns strangers into neighbours and neighbours into family. Seeing God's image reflected in the eyes of every human being on earth. Hospitality opens arms and doors wide and transparently breaks our hearts over this lost world and the image bearers who like us before the Lord's rescue stumble in seductive darkness. It seeks the salvation of the stranger and fellowship seeks the building up in faith of the brother and sister. When we practice hospitality, we live out our real, messy and redeemed lives before stranger and brother alike, demonstrating to a watching world that the blood of Christ is thicker than the bond of shared last names or the blood of biology. We serve a God who sought us out while we were strangers. God found us, took us in, made us part of his family and brought us to his table. Our homes are not castles, but incubators and hospitals. They open doors. They seek out the underprivileged. They know that the gospel comes with a house key. They see their homes not as their homes at all, but as God's gift to use for the furtherance of his kingdom. We live in a time now of such isolation and loneliness, a time of political polarization, picking up the pieces from a global pandemic, digital war, and about two years of social distancing. The world needs us to practice hospitality, to show love to the stranger. Making strangers feel comfortable in our homes enables this dispelling of loneliness and builds a sense of community. Romans 12 verse 13, practice hospitality. The meaning of practice, to put hospitality is such an, in such an intense 
effort and definite purpose and goal. But how do we do it? As I mentioned before, without grumbling, our hearts have to be right in this. And Hebrews 13 talks about not neglecting hospitality, for some have even met angels in doing so. So you could hear this message today and try and dismiss it or try and spiritualize it by saying, it's just not my gift. It's not my thing. But I want you to know that the practice of hospitality is for every Christ follower. Hospitality relies on all demographics, all personalities and incomes. It's being who you are in Christ and gather others in. Sharing all that we have and who we are with whomever God sends our way. For following Christ means we go after people of society and all of society, especially those forgotten, including the poor, the sick and the lonely. You know, in Acts 28, we read of Paul. Paul, he was a man. He was single. He was an apostle and he was under house arrest at this time. And yet this did not stop him practicing hospitality. The Bible says how he zealously practiced life-giving hospitality. He welcomed people into his home. In all the practices mentioned, as we are on week eight, we are not on our own in them. Thank goodness we have the help of the Holy Spirit whom we can count on to help us live the practices. But it still comes down to a choice as to whether you're going to try and make changes in your life to enable you to put the practices into place. These practices are how Jesus lived. We want to be followers of Jesus. This is how Jesus lived. Let us become more like him in every area of our lives. Let us, where we don't have the right attitude towards it or feel completely out of our depth, let us ask the Holy Spirit for help. What a gift, the Holy Spirit. Let us depend on him. That is a great, the best starting place. Don't dismiss this because it might seem hard or feel like another addition taking time away from an already busy life. But instead, embrace it and just think, how? How can I put this into practice? It doesn't have to start huge. What little thing can I do to make a change? You know, discuss it at your table. Find someone who can stand with you in it, encourage you and ask you how you're getting on with it. I honestly believe that this practice of hospitality will bring kingdom to our communities. So just to conclude, really, You can hear this message and think of perfectly valid reasons why you cannot engage in this practice. You might not have a lot of money, a big home. You might have a busy job, a hectic family life. You can't cook and the list goes on. But we need to allow the scripture to speak to us, to allow scripture to direct us. And scripture clearly says, practice hospitality, love the stranger, be inconvenienced for the sake of the kingdom. So practice hospitality applies to us all. Just to finish. It'd be great just just if we can just close our eyes and just just for a minute just think or if something's come to mind take this time to ask the Holy Spirit If nothing's come to mind, ask the Holy Spirit, what is it you want him to say to me through this? What do I need to change in me? We hope that you've been blessed by this message. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at www.kingschurchwirral.co.uk.